Thank you for logging in. This is Sue Kenny Falzer at the Ethiopian Community Development Council. Welcome to our webinar on the Syrian refugee population, which will be um, presented by Liam Elul. And this is to prepare our affiliates for the incoming uh, Syrian refugee population coming to the United States in the next few years. A couple of logistical details. Um, everyone is currently muted. So if you have a question or a comment, please type it into the questions function on your screen. That's part of GoToWebinar. Liam will answer all questions at the end of the presentation. We do hope to finish this webinar in about an hour. But if we go over by a few minutes, we ask for your patience. And now I'd like to introduce, introduce Liam Elul. She is a trauma therapist with a specialization in complex emergencies and urban refugees in the Middle East, North Africa region. Liam received her postgraduate diploma from the American University in Cairo on psychosocial interventions for refugees and forced migrants, and her master's degree in, in international disaster psychology from the University of Denver. She's worked with refugees both prior to and following resettlement in the United States. Liam has worked largely internationally with international NGOs over the past decade, including in Egypt, Syria, Oman, Ghana, and Jordan, and has pub published on the impact of culture on the experience of psychosocial distress, as well as program development. In Syria, she worked with UNHCR Damascus, piloting a psychosocial program for the organization as the monitoring and evaluation focal point. Liam is currently a psychotherapist trainer and clinical supervisor with the Center for Victims of Torture in Amman, Jordan. We're very pleased to welcome Liam, and at this point, I will turn it over to you. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am going to jump right in. So um, I'll be presenting a bit on the Syrian refugee population um, currently across the Middle East, but specifically in Jordan because um, that's the group that I have the most contact with. So I'm going to give a little bit of background on Syria. So, so if you could advance. Um, so as most of you probably know, in March 2011, protests in Daraa in southern Syria sparked events which led to um, an ongoing conflict. Syria is a remarkably diverse country which has been part of what's been prolonging um, the, the conflicts. In ancient history, due to the, its position in the Levant and on the Mediterranean, waves and in, invaders swept through the area, leaving a variety of ethnic and religious com, uh, pockets which remain to this day. In addition, um, the geography in the country ranges from mountainous and very green to river plains to desert, resulting in a variety of livelihood options. So we have people who are agricultural, who are pastoral, who are industrial, um, who are urbanized, and a large proportion of the population um, lives along the coast and in the cities, particularly in the west of the country. Most of them are, are urbanized and educated. You can see on the map um, kind of a depiction of, of how varied the population is. So a little bit of background on the politics. Uh, Syria is currently an autocracy, although it does maintain a semi-elected council as a president. Um, in modern times, it was part of the Ottoman Empire until the end of World War I, and then was colonized by the French until the end of World War II. There were a series of unsuccessful governments um, until a nationalist coup resulted in the current regime under the Assad family and the Ba'ath Party. Under the current conflict, uh, until the current conflict, um, Bashar al-Assad was the son of, of Hafez. He was generally considered to be an improvement over his father, although there were still um, muhabarat, or secret police, all over the place. Um, they're very powerful disappearances um, for anybody who is against the government continued to happen. Um, torture was repeated to be happening, and criticism of the government um, almost always led to re a re arrest and detention. OK, can advance. Um, so one of the major difficulties that Syrians being resettled in the US will be facing is that um, due to the lack of exposure prior to the crisis, because U.S. relations, relations with Syria um, were non-existent, the majority of the American population, to the majority of them, uh, this is what Syria looks like. And this is their understanding of the country. Whereas, if you advance, um, 
Susan, if you could advance the things. So whereas to Syrians, their image of their country is like this. Um, and if you advance again, this is the capital, Damascus, prior to the war. It was the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. Uh, it was quite lovely to live in. Open air streets, um, cafe, street side cafes, markets, very beautiful architecture. Um, and Syrians were very proud of their country and particularly of their capital. So if you continue, Susan. Um, so since the start of the conflict, an estimated 6.8 million um, people have been displaced within Syria, and an additional 3.8 million Syrians have been displaced outside the country. This makes them the largest existing refugee population currently. Um, the majority of this burden has been on neighboring countries in the Levant, most of whom are in economic or political difficulties themselves. And only about 400,000 of those outside the country um, are being hosted in the myriad refugee camps kind of scattered throughout the region. The rest live in urban settings, uh, most of them in extremely difficult or insecure circumstances. And although 3.7 billion has been requested in emergency response by the UN and other large INGOs, to date only about 54% of that is funded, which leaves many refugees without services. We can advance. Um, so this map indicates the density of the refugees dispersed across the region. The little dots are camps. Um, the demographic of the refugees that you'll be seeing depends largely on where they're being resettled from. So, so the Syrian population, um, their education levels and their SES really depended on where they were from within the country. And um, demographically, um, that's, that's largely affected also where they've ended up. So Jordan, for example, um, hosts refugees primarily from the tribal south, so Dera, and from the Druze areas, Sueda, and also from Damascus, whereas Turkey primarily has Syrians from the more affluent northern areas, Aleppo, and also the Kurdish districts in the east. Lebanon hosts refugees from the agricultural west and coastal regions, including the cities of Homs, Damascus, and Aleppo. Egypt, most of the refugees are from Damascus, who are able to fly out of the country. And in Iraq, uh, most of the refugees are coming from the Kurdish areas in the tribal east as well. So this map gives you a visual kind of of the displacement patterns. And I'm going to give a brief summary of the countries that the refugees are in, the major asylum countries currently. So starting with Jordan. It's estimated that there are nearly a million refugees in Jordan, although only about 600,000 are actually registered. So. 80% of them are in urban areas, and many of those are not registered. So the 20% who live in the camps along the border, the most famous of them is Zatari, um, are all registered. So when, when Syrian refugees come across the border, the Jordanian border police um, kind of herd them onto buses and drive them to Zatari. Most of them get registered in Zatari, but the conditions are not great, and so a lot of them end up leaving um, and decide to take their chances in urban areas. Um, approximately 19% have arrived illegally, and those who do register in the camp and then move to an urban area without a Jordanian sponsor are considered illegal and don't have access to services even in urban areas usually. So this map um, gives you an idea of where the Syrian population is currently residing in Jordan, although honestly this is quickly changing due to the current situation. Uh, many Syrians are feeling unsafe close to the northern borders due to threats of ISIS attacks um, after what happened with the Jordanian pilot and increased involvement from Jordan. So many of them are moving to Amman uh, or moving further south. Just a brief bit on Zatari. The camp was established in July 2012. Um, and it's, if you can see it, it's an abandoned airstrip where it was initially started and um, therefore is is subject to pretty extreme weather conditions, um, particularly given the winter that we've just had. It initially um, looked like a refugee camp that you see in photos uh, with tents and, and whatnot, but it's really developed in the last two years. Um, at this point, it kind of feels like a city. It has its own economy. There's a 
um, a main street stretching from the main gate with the police checkpoints. It's called the Champs Elysees, crowded with foot traffic um, and all the makeshift shift shops um, that are selling amenities that the UN can't provide. So SIM cards, everything, ice cream even. Uh, and this is really important because um, Syrians are not allowed to work currently in Jordan. So this is really the only source of income that many have. And kind of to give you an idea of what it has looked like recently with the extreme weather. It's not a particularly friendly or private place. Uh, Lebanon hosts about 1.1 million refugees, which is huge for Lebanon. It's about a quarter of the population. And most of them are living in the Beka Valley, which is in the east of Lebanon along the Syrian border, um, with some in Beirut and in an area called Mount Lebanon. Um, there's no camp situations in Lebanon because the government is worried about um, what that says politically to Syria in terms of Lebanon making a, a criticism about how the Syrian government is handling the current situation. So the government has refused to set up camps and only recently um, agreed to recognize refugees, only in 2013. So most Syrians live in urban situations with host families or in rented accommodation. Um, or in kind of informal makeshift nomadic camps. And assistance is largely provided by civil society with the spattering of NGOs. This map kind of shows you where the, on the right, or on the left, um, where the Syrians are coming from. So mostly northeastern Syria, and in that small map on the left, where they're going. So the dark red spot is Becca Valley. And then kind of a visual for what their living situation looks like currently. Turkey hosts the most refugees currently, um, about 1.6 million, a third of whom are hosted in government-run camps. Turkey has an extremely restrictive asylum policy, and this has been particularly the case with the Syrian population because of the large proportion of Kurds that are crossing the border, which makes the, Syrian, or the Turkish government understandably nervous. Um, they've had a lot of Kurdish unrest. But the remaining 70% are in urban settings um, and are really struggling through a lack of services. The camps in Turkey are probably the best equipped. Um, they have a lot of these caravans that you can see pict pictured here. Um, but still, many Syrians pr uh, prefer the independence of living outside. Um, and then briefly, Iraq and Syria um, they host relatively few refugees. In Iraq, most of them are from the tribal, tribal populations in eastern Syria, and um, they're mostly in camps along the border. The Syrians in Egypt are notable because they live almost entirely in urban settings and are probably the most vulnerable um, of all the populations. Under Morsi, there was considerable support being provided, but this ended with the change in the government um, recently under Sisi, and um, Egypt in the last six months has been accused of illegally detaining and deporting Syrians. So um, any Syrians coming from Egypt are probably going to have a high level of anxiety and trauma. So for all refugees in countries of first asylum, which is the first country that they go to after um, they leave their own, there are three options. So there's local integration in that country of first asylum, there's repatriation to their home country, and then for about 1% of the most vulnerable, there's resettlement. Um, so currently, it's estimated that almost 400,000 refugees in these five main host countries I just talked about are in need of resettlement. Um, only about 60,000 places have been offered since the start of the crisis, which is about 1.7% of the current population displaced outside of Syria. And most of those places have been in Europe, in Germany and Sweden. Those are just the places offered. Um, that is not the total number of those who have been resettled so far. However, this year, um, thankfully, the number is expected to rise in the U.S., and so you guys are going to be getting a whole bunch of folks. Um, if you advance, the U.S. government announced that it's going to take 10,000 refugees, Syrian refugees, in 2015, which you all probably know uh, is only a seventh of what we usually take annually, but it's still a great... Um, a great move forward. One problem, though, is that the app, uh, applicants for DHS um, are going to have to apply or do interviews in Amman or Istanbul. 
So this is really going to limit resettlement from Lebanon, Egypt, and Iraq currently. Uh, most of the folks we'll be seeing will probably be coming through Jordan or Turkey. Um, so if we look at who is being resettled, UNHCR usually resettles the most vulnerable populations. And by UNHCR standards, this means female-headed households, survivors of torture, the elderly, those with extreme medical conditions that can't be handled in a country of asylum, and then also um, those who are facing um, ongoing persecution in the country of asylum. So for example, we have um, a case currently of a man who's homosexual and gets con um, continually raped in Jordan because of the way that he presents. So he's a case um, for, for settlement. This means that the need for services is extremely high. Um, an interesting fact is that the population is slightly skewed for those coming from Syria because as a lot of the, the single mothers or female-headed households that have been offered resettlement have been refusing because they have husbands that um, are still fighting or who have disappeared but they believe are alive and that they don't want to be separated from. So um, this means that it's going to be a slightly different population that you're going to be seeing. Also, many Syrians um, that have been offered resettlement by UNHCR and many of the Syrians that we've been seeing really want to go back to Syria. Um, they don't want to be resettled necessarily, and so there's been a high rate of re refusal, which has been very interesting with this population. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, the symptoms that you're probably going to be seeing. So um, most of the, well, all of, all of the refugees are victims of war or other violence. Um, most of them have experienced threat to self or close others. And the most common things that we've been hearing is that they've witnessed bombings. We have a lot of people who are afraid of planes. Um, when they hear the sounds of planes, especially children, um, they often get a startle response or extremely afraid. Um, many have been exposed to injured or dead bodies, and we have a proportion that have also been exposed to chemical attacks. There's um, also been a significant SGBV um, experience among the Syrian refugees, both male and female. Um, this particularly happens in detention, especially for men, and it's extremely stigmatized. A lot of people aren't talking about it until later on in therapy, but um, one of the other things that we've been seeing is a lot of early marriage um, of young women in order, in an effort for their families to protect them. Um, so they've been marrying them very young um, in their early teens, and this results in, in SGBV as well. Um, and then increased domestic violence when you have a population that's under stress, a family that's under stress, particularly in instances where the men can't work. So for example, in Jordan, um, so they're home and there's a lot of um, anxiety and pressure, not a lot of resources, and sometimes um, actually women become increasingly empowered because they're the ones who can more easily work illegally. Um, so they, in a highly patriarchal society, suddenly have a woman who's the one who's earning the money um, this often results in, in an increase in domestic violence, and we've been seeing that here, and you can expect to probably be seeing that in the U.S. as well. So some of the common effects of trauma um, among adults are depression, anger, tearfulness, anxiety, um, what we call flat, flat affect, so this numbed out emotions, um, social isolation, which is notable in um, Middle Eastern populations where socialization is very important. Um, sleep disturbances, particularly insomnia and nightmares, both among adults and children. Difficulty concentrating and focusing. This is going to be something that um, would be good for your staff to be aware of because sometimes you're going to tell somebody something and they're going to need to hear it over and over and over again for it to sink in, not just because of the newness of the situation, but they're having difficulty creating new memories and um, focusing their attention enough in order to create that memory. There's a lot of impaired daily functioning, so um, people who can't get themselves out of bed, shower, dress, they can't cook, they can't take care of their kids. Um, you have a lot of physical pain, both from actual injury, um, from torture, and then also a lot of psychosomatic symptoms. It's more socially acceptable to display physical pain than to display mental pain. So you often get headaches or stomach aches or back aches that are indicative of um, a lot of emotional distress. 
and then as I said, domestic violence. With kids, um, we're seeing a lot of aggression and hyperactivity, which is generally more common in boys, not exclusively, and then a lot of withdrawal and isolation, more common in girls. Um, we're also seeing a proportion of bedwetting and nightmares, um, also sleep disturbances. Um, so some of the challenges that Syrians are going to be facing is that they come from an old and culturally very um, rich and respected heritage. There's a lot of um, pride in where they came from, a lot of dignity, and now a lot of disillusionment for what they've lost. Um, it's interesting having worked in Syria with the Iraqi refugees and watching this similar pattern happen in Jordan where um, the Iraqis came in and initially the Syrians you know, welcomed them as brothers and provided a lot of services and then as resources got increasingly scarce they began to get frustrated and suspicious and irritated with the Iraqis. There were a lot of um, rumors going around about instability being caused by Iraqis and a rejection of the population. And now the same thing is happening to the Syrians in Jordan. So they initially came in and particularly because there's a lot of intermarriage between the tribes on the border. Um, the folks who were coming in from Dara often were coming to cousins or coming to family. Um, and so they were really welcomed initially. And then um, increasingly there's been frustration and suspicion in the Jordanian population that they're stealing our jobs or they're hurting the economy, they're making rents very high. And now that you know, we don't know, maybe they're extremists, maybe they're causing some of this violence, maybe they're going to bring ISIS across the border. Um, so a lot of suspicion. There was a, um, a Syrian client that we had who told us that he felt like, um, like a rejected girlfriend. Like initially you tell this woman all these sweet words to get her to want to be with you and then you decide you want somebody else and then you do everything you can to make her leave. And that's how the Syrian population is really feeling right now. So there's a lot of distrust. In terms of resettlement, their primary desire that they're expressing, expressing is a future for their kids. So education, health, um, stability for their kids. And then secondly is um, work, being able to provide for their families. Again, there's this um, real sense of dignity and they feel like their lives have been put on hold and a lot of people express shame at not being able to work, not being able to support their families while they've been displaced. And so many are very anxious to, to become independent. There is a potential for distrust with the U.S. We don't have the best history with Syria. Um, and politically, there is a lot of um, propaganda and a lot of rumors um, about the U.S. and about Americans during the embargo. Um, and also, uh, they heard a lot of stories coming from the Iraqis who were refugees in, in Syria about the way that the American military behaved. So there was a lot of um, bad feeling about, about the U.S. And there was an extreme, extremely limited access to information while they were in Syria. So I would say for the staff to really um, anticipate a lot of mixed feelings about resettlement, this hope for the future and that it will be um, stable and better, but um, also maybe some resentment about where they're being resettled. And also because America didn't intervene very early in the revolution and it feels like, well, now it's too late. Um, so feeling like they um, turned a blind eye. Um, and many are struggling with the loss of status here, so we're seeing a lot of depression. As for partners and services, because your offices are scattered um, across the U.S., I don't know specific partners, but in terms of things to look for, education and structured activities for kids, both in terms of um, helping them to, to integrate, but also it's the best thing you can do for trauma for kids is to, um, to structure their lives again and to, to create a structured and safe environment for them to be in. Uh, language and employment training, clearly psychosocial support. Uh, most of the people that you get, because this is coming from the most vulnerable population, are going to need quite a bit of support. Um, we're seeing a, a really high proportion of torture. Uh, medical services, and um, systems education. So largely in the Middle East, even if systems exist, um, they're often so difficult and bureaucratic that no one actually follows them. There's a system called WASTA, which means connections, 
So I don't go to the office, to the government office, and go through the line, which might take all day, and you know, talk to this guy and get this stamp, and then go to the next office. Instead, I'm going to talk to my friend's cousin who works in that office and give him my paperwork, and that's how it's going to get done. So um, for a lot of Syrians coming to the U.S. who are going to have to be doing things like filing for Social Security or um, filing for food stamps, all of this bureaucratic stuff that, that they're going to have to do in the first few months, uh, many are probably going to need help and guidance through that, not used to that type of a system. Uh, and then preparing staff and communities. Um, the communities in the U.S., as I, as I said early on in the presentation, probably are going to have a, a skewed perception of Syria, um, similar to how Syrians have a skewed percep perception of the U.S. There was not a lot of information about Syria prior to this crisis, um, so people aren't going to have an understanding of um, the history and culture that the Syrian population is coming from. And educating or sensitizing the, the communities that the Syrians are being resettled into is probably going to go a long way towards avoiding prejudice um, and facilitating integration. Um, Syrian food is delicious. You could do a bunch of potlucks. That's a really good and easy way to start to get people to interact um, and as a cultural exchange. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, a lot of the, the Syrians are actually quite well educated. Uh, many speak French fluently, some speak English fluently. So um, empowering the refugees by having them be part of hosting these um, maybe Q&A sessions or these sensitization sessions could be an idea. Um, and also sensitizing um, the communities regarding cultural norms. So. Some of you have been resettling Iraqis are probably used to a lot of these um, shoes off inside houses, kind of conservative, semi-formal dress. If, um, if you're helping to integrate them, probably not wearing tank tops and shorts on the first time that you meet them, um, even for men. Um, and then respecting the, the gender segregation. A lot of the Syrians who are um, from urban settings are quite Europeanized and quite modernized um, and are used to interacting between genders. However, um, a lot of the folks that you'll probably be getting from, from Jordan are from these tribal areas in the south, which are much more conservative. Um, so you'll be getting women who are niqabi, so covered, their faces are covered as well as their hair, and who are reluctant to come into contact with men. This is something that they're going to have to be eased into, particularly if it's single female households. Um, so just to keep in mind, as you're helping them integrate locally, um, to, that this is going to be something that might be a difficult barrier for them to overcome. Um, also sensitizing your staff in terms of trauma symptoms, um, training on referral mechanisms. We're actually getting um, a high proportion of cases who are suicidal or who have suicidal ideation, and part of that is due to feeling stuck in, in Jordan um, and the restricted ability to work or not, a, not being able to move towards the future. Um, so I'm expecting that you'll have much less of that in the U.S., but um, just to be aware that that is something that we're encountering, a lot of behavioral problems in kids, um, and also, as I said earlier, the domestic violence. So um, having places to refer to and um, sensitizing your staff in terms of who might be in need of referral. Um, I know this is very difficult because of the, the financial restrictions on resettling refugees, but if it's possible to not resettle symptomatic clients into housing areas that have a lot of crime and violence, um, anything that's going to be triggering. So um, areas with a lot of of drug violence where they might be exposed to gunshots, also areas that are near airports, given the high proportion of, of people who have anxiety by hearing airplanes, um, just to keep in mind, I know that's difficult to manage. Common foods and ingredients, um, making sure that they know where to get them. A lot of the, the um, vegetables that Syrians eat are available in the U.S., which is great, uh, making sure 
that they have access to halal meat, which is um, slaughtered in an Islamic way, and that they know where to access that. Um, also putting them into contact with um, appropriate religious institutions, as this is a form of social support, kind of connecting them to that community. Um, one thing that, that we encountered when I was working um, with some of the East Africans that were being resettled is they had difficulty with um, kind of modern housing and appliances. You really won't find that with Syrians. Most of them have um, have a lot of familiarity, and even if they didn't come from urban areas, um, have lived in modern housing. So it looks like I'm way ahead of time, but if there are any questions, I'm really happy to answer. Liam, wow, that was so informative. Thank you so much. Your, your expertise is really valued. Um, I, I had a, a question first before we dive into um, the participants' questions. And you mentioned that most Syrians have a high level of education. Does that include mm -hmm. those that are coming from the, from the more like tribal, more rural areas as well, or more just the urban uh, refugees? Um, so from the more tribal areas, they're probably going to have education through the seventh or eighth grade. Um, we are encountering a number of kind of middle-aged women and older women who uh, can't write. They're illiterate um, or pre-literate. But um, most of the younger generation is going to be able to read and write in Arabic. Um, and some of them are going to have education in French or English as well. Dara is, um, is going to have a lower level of education generally. So the folks who are coming from Jordan are probably going to have lower levels of education than the folks who are coming to you from Turkey. Okay, great, thanks. Um, mm -hmm. I encourage all this, the people on the call to please type in your questions into the question function. Um, the first question we got here asks, will, will we be seeing Syrians resettled only in cities where there is already a population of Syrians, or will they be in other cities as well? Um, Liam, I don't know if you, you may not have any information to answer that question. Um, I don't know that. My guess is that um, they're going to be resettled wherever there are places to put them because there's so many of them coming in, but I don't have a solid answer to that. Yeah, and, and my, um, my two cents from what I've been hearing from various meetings and whatnot is that the State Department really doesn't know yet where um, where the Syrians are going to be asking to go, or if there's going to be a lot of U.S. Thai cases or not. Obviously, mm -hmm. if they're U.S. Thai cases, they'll go to the place where that U.S. Thai is. But the non-U.S. Thai cases are going to be generally spread out among the different networks across the country. So I expect that they'll probably be pretty spread out, and and will probably be in areas where there may not be an established Syrian community yet. Mm -hmm. um, One thing but, about the go ahead. sorry. Um, because of the, the difficult relations between the U.S. and Syria, as far as I know, there, um, there are relatively few U.S. Thai cases coming in. There are some, but not, as, not that many. Right. Uh, the next question asks, does the 10,000 refugees the U.S. will accept in 2015 refer solely to Syrians? And yes, I, I believe yes. You, were just re you were referring to the Syrians only, correct? Yes, as far as I know, the U.S takes about 70,000 refugees a year, and they've promised 30,000 places over the next three years, um, so approximately 10,000 places per year for Syrians. Great. Um, the next comment uh, starts with, thanks for this very insightful presentation. One of the main problems we have faced with Iraqi resettled refugees was their refusal to work minimal jobs. Um, I'm assuming that means like minimum wage jobs. Should we expect mm -hmm. that from Syrian refugees as well? That will be a difficulty um, with the Syrian refugees. Again, that will be more of a difficulty probably for those coming from Turkey who are coming from more educated areas um, where they held higher positions. From there, uh, a lot of the people were um, pastoral or agricultural, so you might not encounter that so much. Um, but yes, that's you're going to have a lot of pride in terms of the, culturally um, there's a lot of respect for for example doctors or engineers you refer to somebody by their education title and so there's a lot of pride in that 
and it's going to be something that, that the refugees are going to struggle with coming to the U.S. and having to take minimum wage, low educated jobs. Um, the next question says, millions of children face untold misery, already traumatized by war, social upheaval, and are facing a life of catastrophe in the refugee camps without education or normal childhood freedoms. How should we prepare to overcome some of these challenges for the children who are enrolled in U.S. schools to attain education? Any specific formula? Hmm. Yeah. So um, the Jordanian government and also the Turkish government have been providing education in camps. Um, it's according to their local curriculum. Um, but those are services that have been provided. In terms of dealing with the exposure to trauma, the number one thing that you can do for kids, um, all research says, is support the family. If a child has been through absolute hell, as long as their family is able to stay together and stay healthy and help them make meaning out of that experience, the kid is going to rebound and they should be okay. If a kid has been through something relatively light, and the family falls apart and you see a lot of domestic violence and there's um, a lot of difficulty and instability in their family situation, they're going to have a lot of difficulty in terms of recovering. So honestly, um, and this is one of the issues that um, I personally have with, with the American resettlement system, is that we tend to bank on the kids and um, without realizing that if the family falls apart, the child is not going to um, going to be able to thrive usually so having services in schools that really help the parents um, understand what the kids are going through and that also support the parents in supporting their children that help educate parents in terms of how to deal with trauma how to deal with their symptoms how to make meaning out of what's happened to them and how to get them to focus on the future and have hope for the future Great. Um, thank you for that. The next question asks, how are the relations between Syrians and Iraqis? Hmm. Um, I guess maybe they're referring to on... in, the, in, the U, in the U.S. specifically, but I don't know if you could re refer to either. Mm -hmm. um, so historically, Iraq was looked at as kind of the heart of Arab civilization. Um, even under Saddam, they were considered to have the best education system um, and kind of the most advanced society. So Iraqis see themselves as um, more advanced and better educated than Syrians, and some Syrians also see them that way. The, um, that might cause some, uh, some strife between the groups, although honestly you're probably going to get uh, more friction between, or more difficulty between Syrians and and, um, and the local population in terms of trying to integrate because of the language barrier. So you might see a lot more bonding between Syrians and Iraqis, also due to, to common adversity experience. Um, we've been seeing, we have a lot of groups, most of, our, most of our psychosocial support is through group work, and we have a lot of groups that are joint Iraqi-Syrian, and initially um, there's some friction and mistrust, but usually by the third or fourth session, um, that's been overcome, and so it can be facilitated. Um. Okay. I, I think um, maybe part of that question um, comes from uh, most of our sites don't have Syrians on staff, but they may have Iraqi, Iraqis mm -hmm. on staff or Iraqi interpreters, and maybe it's just to make sure that there won't be any sort of friction if there's an Iraqi interpreter or, or case mm -hmm. manager assigned. So it sounds like um, that, that shouldn't be a problem. No, that shouldn't be a problem. One thing to be aware of with the interpreters, though, is that it's a very different dialect, um, Iraqi and Syrian. I mean, they can understand each other, but a lot of words for things are different. Um, so in terms of um, helping your, your Iraqi interpreter, just understanding that it's going to take them a little while to get used to a Syrian dialect and that the interpretation isn't going to be 100%. Um, so there may be some, some cultural and linguistic differences, um, and there may be some prejudice. I've encountered this before um, with previously resettled populations and helping newly resettled ones. There's, um, 
there's sometimes some prejudice coming from the, the interpreters. So just to be aware of that. There's a question along those same lines asking what dialect is most similar to the Syrian dialect? Lebanese. Um, depending on where they come from. If it's the north or west, it's going to be Lebanese. If it's the south or east, it's going to be Jordanian because it's more of a Bedou um, dialect. Hmm. And the tribes are more similar. We have a question. Um, is there structured ESL and cultural orientation being provided in the camps? No ESL. Um, usually the U.S. does a cultural education. Um, when, when people have been selected for resettlement, there's usually a three-day kind of cultural orientation bit done by, um, by the U.S. government. I've had a lot of mixed reviews about that. Um, so some people found it helpful, some people didn't. I think it really depends on who's doing the cultural orientation, but it's pretty basic. Um, a lot of what people are going to be coming in with are biases from TV and from movies, and even that's probably going to be a little bit limited because um, Syria had an embargo on a lot of Western TV. They did get some, but, um, but not that much. So um, that is something that you're going to be working with. That said, there's a lot of familiarity with European culture, um, particularly French, and um, a lot of more educated Syrians went to Eastern Europe or to the UK or to France to study. So it really depends on who you're going to get. If you get folks from the cities, a lot of times they dress in Western clothing. If you get folks from Dara or from the south or east, um, they're going to be in, in Jalabiya, so the long white robe, the men will, um, with a um, kifia, it's the red and white checkered cloth um, over their head. And a lot of the women will be, most of the Syrian women will be in um, long, button-down jackets that reach the floor, whatever their house dress is. You mentioned um, uh, some women may also have their face covered. Is that correct? Yeah, from the south. Um, most of the women that we've been seeing don't, but from the south, um, you're going to get probably about 15 to 20 percent who wear niqab. Um, I don't know if they will decide to continue wearing niqab once they're in the U.S., but they are wearing them in Jordan. Okay. We have a question. Um, what is the average family size? Large, larger, smaller, or about the same as Iraqis? Probably about the same as Iraqis. Um, from, again, from the more educated populations, probably about three kids, um, parents and three kids. From the more tribal populations, up to six kids. Um, but mostly we're seeing, in Jordan, we're seeing between three and five. Three and five children? Mm -hmm. Yeah, with, with two parents. So that's still a pretty um, large There's a lot family. of extended family. Mm -hmm. If we have five children and two adults, the size of family of seven can be mm -hmm. difficult. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so again, that's going to depend on where you're getting them from, um, where they're coming from. Um, the next question asks, um, what are the most, uh, I'll read it as he wrote it, uh, what are the most cultural pride of Syrians that we can use as an incentive to create rapport with them? So I guess hmm. aspects, aspects of their cultural pride mm -hmm. that maybe the agency can use to create that rapport. That's a great question, actually. Um, I would say just recognizing um, Recognizing that, that Syria was a relatively advanced country, um, I mean, still still is, but um, saying things like, you know, Damascus is a beautiful city. Like, look up some, some early photos. It's hard to find them now, actually. It was interesting to do a Google image search um, because it really shows you the difference. When I first moved there, um, you do a Google image search, and what you get are all of the crusader castles that are beautiful and located throughout Syria, and now you do a Google image search and you get destroyed everything and dead bodies. So um, try and do a, an image search of some of the cities that folks are coming from so that you can talk about, um, I mean, the architecture was gorgeous. People have a lot of pride in the fact that um, there was a lot, a lot of kind of Greek and Roman influence. 
and a lot of education in that area. Um, I think the first psychiatric hospital is argued to have been in Damascus. Um, so if you if you look up, I mean, even if you just Wikipedia the kind of the ancient history, and you show that you understand and have a respect for um, for the history that that was seated in Syria. The other thing is food. Syria is known throughout the Middle East for having the best food, um, particularly Aleppo is the culinary capital of the Middle East, and so um, Syrian food is really well renowned, and people are very proud of that. And art and music. Honestly, as well. Um, I just put it back to the slide that had some of the um, demographic information on there. Uh -huh. because we, we went through that one kind of quickly, and I know myself okay. I wanted to look at that again. So I apologize to those of you who saw some weird stuff happening on the screen just now. Um, the next question is, are the Kurdish speakers relatively speaking the same dialect, dialect as Iraqi Kurds? Yes, um, from the east. So um, thanks for putting this slide back up. That's great. So the, um, the Kurdish areas in the northeast, I mean, technically, that's what they're fighting for Kurdistan, right? So a portion of Iraq, a portion of Turkey, a portion of Syria. And that dialect is, is largely similar. Um, you get some Kurds that are kind of dispersed throughout the country, but um, the Kurdish language is, is pretty similar. And I'm just looking at the religions that you have listed here. So there, 10% mm -hmm. is, is not that small of an amount of Christians. Um, I was a little bit surprised to see that many. Um, yeah, there's actually a large proportion of Christians. And the Syriacs, some of them don't speak Arabic. They speak Syriac, um, especially the kids. Most of the parents will speak Arabic, but the kids will only speak Syriac. Um, mm. So that's also a thing that, um, to keep in mind and something that we've been running into. Um, and what is what is Druze, the three percent? I'm not familiar. Druze or Druzy is um, it's related to Islam, but it's not Muslims don't consider it Islam and, and Druze have their own book. It's um, it's a mystic religion based on kind of Islam and ancient Christianity. Um, so it's its own religion. And um, they were, the Druze population um, were persecuted under Hafez al-Assad, and then Bashar kind of backed off. Um, but they still, like Sueda, which is the area that they're from, got very little in the way of services, and um, uh, they had a difficult time of it. But a lot of them have actually stayed in Syria. Um, we have a small proportion of Druze here, but most of them have stayed in, in Sueda. Hmm. Interesting. So you probably won't be getting that many. Yeah, they've got a different sense of dress, too. Um, a lot of the women don't cover. Um, a lot of the men have a very particular hat that they wear, kind of a cap. A question just came in asking if the, the Druze are the same as the Chaldini of Iraq? No, no, they're not the same as the Chaldeans. Ka uh, Chaldeans are a type of Christianity. Um, so it's a different, uh, different religion. Um, are there any more questions from the audience? We, we are, we're finishing up a little bit early here. Uh, let's see, I have one more question that came in. What part of Syria are most of the refugees coming from? So my guess from the information that I know right now about um, where the U.S., how they're handling the resettlement, so you have to go through um, the office either in Turkey or in um, Jordan, so you're either going to get uh, folks from this northern area around Aleppo, um, so either a more rural Kurdish, somewhat Bedou population, you can see the gray and the yellow at the top, um, or a more educated urban population from Aleppo or Idlib, um, or you're going to be getting um, from Jordan a, a um, more pastoralist Bedou group from Dera and the south, some from Damascus, so again, some urban, um, often from what they call Reef Damascus, which is the, the outskirts of Damascus. So that's going to be a more Sunni Arab population um, ranging from urban to pretty pastoral. 
We have another question about languages. Besides mm -hmm. Arabic and Kurdish, what are the other languages most popular, or the most popular languages? And what are they most related to? So that if we don't have that language, what other language might be able to understand them? Most Syrians are going to speak Arabic because all of the education system was in Arabic. Um, you will get Kurds who, um, some of the older Kurds will probably not speak, that, speak Arabic that well. Um, similarly, um, you can get some um, Marianites, like Marianite Christians, and who might speak Aramaic, or a kind of modern version of Aramaic, and the Syriac Christians who will speak Syriac. Most people who are above school age will speak Arabic. Um, the place that you're really going to have to worry about it is kids who um, are going to be mainly exposed to language within the home. Um, you'll get, you know, there's also a small proportion of Armenian Christians who you'll also get some Armenian. Again, this is mostly going to be with kids. For the most part, you're going to be able to use Arabic interpreters. Um, we got a comment just to, to let us know that uh, one of our affiliates is saying that they have received some Syrian cases coming out of Egypt. Um, mm. to let us know that they're not only coming out of Turkey and Jordan, apparently. That's great. Um, I'm glad that they're resettling from Egypt because that's been a really difficult um, situation. This is a very specific question, so I hope I read it right. But it's um, asking, what is the majority madhab? I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. And then in parentheses it says school of thought of the Sunni. The, I guess the Syrian Sunnis. I, I don't really understand this question because I don't know that much about Islam. I don't know if you understand it well enough to make a comment. Um, I don't, um, I don't, I'm afraid, understand it well enough. Um, yeah. There's, my, my experience of Syrians, if I'm going to, um, what I think that they're getting at, uh, my experience of Syrians is that they're, um, relatively, especially urban, a relatively secularist uh, Sunni. So um, most of them don't pray five times a day. Most of them will pray once. Um, they're often, I mean, they might be pious um, in terms of their religion, but they're often not very um, adamant about religious tenets. Again, for the more tribal populations, that's not necessarily going to be the case. People will probably be more, um, more strictly religious. But um, a lot of what you're seeing with this extremism is not, was not common in the Syrian population in my experience when I was living there. Um, so the thought is that a lot of that's been imported. Um, so if that's, I'm not sure, but I think that might be where they're going. Well, yeah, no, that's very, very helpful. Um, we don't have any more questions. We have one more comment that just from the person mm -hmm. who said they have some refugees that uh, were resettled out of Egypt are saying that their Iraqi caseworker is communicating easily with Excellent. the Syrian refugees. So that's good news. That's really good. Um, so at this point, if we don't have any more questions come in, um, I'd like to say that this webinar was recorded and will be posted to the ECDC YouTube page. So if you have other members of your staff that you would like to view this, uh, this webinar, it'll be available in the next couple of days. And I will send out the PowerPoint that Leanne prepared uh, to all of the registered attendees. So you'll have a copy of that as well. And so at this point, I'd like to just uh, thank you, Leanne, for, for taking the time out of your busy schedule over there in Amman to, to help us better understand the Syrian population so we can provide the best services we can when, when we do start seeing them coming in larger numbers here to the US. So thank you so much. Absolutely, and thank you guys for all the work you're doing on the ground there to help them integrate. It's a hard job, and I'm very appreciative that you're doing it. Okay, so that, that ends the uh, webinar. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye.